Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your grace is free to us, uh, but it cost you your son. His life upon the cross, his blood that was shed for all of us. And Lord, we are so grateful, eternally grateful for the price that he paid on our behalf. That we were sinners, no way of matching you, no way of redeeming ourselves, but Jesus redeemed each one of us. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the position you've lifted us up to, being sons and daughters of yours, knowing one day that we'll leave this earth and we'll be with you, Lord. In the meantime, Lord, we direct ourselves and our hearts to your word. We pray, Lord, that it become our spiritual food, that it becomes a, a light unto our path in this world. And we pray, Lord, this, this evening, like every time we get together, we pray for your blessing upon us. They open our ears and our eyes to see your glory in your word. We pray for your blessing and be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. If we can open up our Bibles to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter, we're going to go from chapter 4, verse 23, and we're going to read through, hopefully, to uh, chapter 5, verse 12. Okay? So Matthew, chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened up his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before them. Up to there. This man called Jesus, and the things that people saw him do were phenomenal. You know, we... We've been talking a bit on the Bible study about healing and uh, that sort of stuff, about all those gifts of the Spirit. Encompassed in Jesus Christ were all of them. All of them. Everybody who was sick, everybody who was, as we read here, epileptic, paralytic, everybody who was blind, everybody who was of all diseases would go to him. If we set our mind at that stage, in that area, where there was no medicine, relatively little medicine, no hospitals, uh, physicians were difficult to find. There was no free and public hospital services you can go to at any time. Everybody was, in suff- was suffering who was sick. If you were sick, you were uh, considered to be the, uh, helpless, unless you had your family who would support you. And you know, since then, medicine has come a long way with regards to finding certain d- the answers to certain diseases and so forth. But set our minds at that time, there were a lot of people who were ill, who couldn't get better. And Jesus comes to this earth, and what does he do? People come to him, and he does what he came to do initially, heal people, and he satisfied their, and made them better with regards to feeling and overcoming their illnesses. They, They were walking when they were lame, they were seeing when they were blind, They were demon-possessed, the Bible says here, and demon-possession, as we see throughout the scripture. 
is a, is a phenomenon, it's a real phenomenon, and we see Jesus taking out those demons and people coming to a normality about how they live their life. And we see here Jesus healing a multitude. Thousands upon thousands were following him, and they wanted to be healed, and they wanted more. Now Jesus, after healing them, after dealing with their physical needs, now he's going to deal with their spiritual needs. And as he was going to deal with their spiritual needs, he was going to deal with our spiritual needs too. And what he does here is that, and seeing the multitudes in chapter 5, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them these things. So he starts, he goes up on a mountain and the multitude follow him, a whole array of people going up to this mountain to listen to him. I want to cast our mind to another mountain, another mountain that many, many uh, hundreds of years before, maybe 2,000 years before, Moses went up on. And it was a different mountain. It was a mountain where God gave the law to Moses. And we read throughout the scriptures about what happened at the, on that mountain. And when, um, at, when I was doing the uh, NGV and trying to find some paintings, and there was one particular painting that I wanted to show the older generation, the Greek generation, because it, it was titled Moses Coming Down from the Mountain. If we could put it up on the uh, overhead. It's a, it's a caricature top of mountain, but all, all the people associated with the book of Exodus are included in there. It's probably not clear. You probably can see over here, there's Moses coming down the mountain with a broken first pair of commandments, uh, Aaron, uh, Miriam. And it, when we started the books of Ex Exodus, we see over here Bezael. He's the artist. And you can tell he's gracious and so forth. So there's a ray of people in this uh, particular painting. And you can see that its purpose was to show them coming, Moses coming down. And it's a huge painting. If you go to the next... Uh, Next slide. Just to, that's how big this was and is. It's not at the NGV at the moment. What I tried to do, I tried to order it. You can order the paintings and get them installed so for viewing, but it would have cost $100,000 to get it installed for viewing. And they said it wasn't that popular anymore because who wants to see and hear about the commandments, the Ten Commandments? Go back to the previous slide. So you have Moses coming down from the mountain and there's something in this painting that led me to this particular chapter we're going to read in the book of Exodus. Behind Moses is, are guards, okay? There's certain guards and their purpose was to stop the people from going on the mountain, okay? And we read about this. If we, read, if we turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus, Chapter 19, chapter 19, verse, nine, verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourself that you do not go up on the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but it shall surely be stoned with an, or shot with an arrow. With a man or beast, he should not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall, they shall come near the mountain. So this is a mountain that... We see here Moses coming down with the commandments. The Bible says that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when we come to this mountain, the first mountain here, we see the law having its full impact. And we read about in other parts of the scripture about the, the mountain and what it did and the purpose for the, for the law and for the commandments. And we read in, the, in Hebrews chapter 12, 
and it talks about now the fact that it compares that mountain with the mountain that Jesus was now going to sp spread the blessed uh, beatitudes that he was going to tell them. And there's a, com there's a uh, comparison, there's a, quite a stark difference between the two. The law came with Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we read in this part of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, it says, For we have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire, and to the blackness and the darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to any of them, for they could not endure what, what was commanded. And if so much as the beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to a innumerable company of angels, to a general assembly and a church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to the God and judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Jesus, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, to the blood and sprinkling that speaks better things than Abel. Better things than Abel. So here we are, we come to a different mountain, different mountain and a different life and a different message. We don't discount the old law. In fact, you'll see here as we go through this part, you'll see the, how different the Ten Commandments were and their imposition compared to these nine blessedness. Does, does Jesus do away with the laws and the commandments, the Ten Commandments? Not at all. The Bible talks about the fact that they, the reason for the Ten Commandments was they were our tutor, our tutor to come to Christ. They were there. They showed us who we are. They showed us the fact that we were sinners before God, that we couldn't keep the commandments, and that pushed us to the great, the, the beatitudes, the blessedness that we're going to hear, hear about. It's different. You'll see it's different. The Ten Commandments were written on stone. Okay? You saw in that painting, and we know about this, that the first commandments came down, they were on stone too, but he saw the Moses saw the people raging and doing the wrong thing and he broke them and then he went up and he received the other commandments that were still written on stone. The blessedness that we're going to read about, it's not written on stone, it's written in the hearts of people. Hearts of people, that's what it was. It's written in the hearts of people, it's written on our, our hearts. So we're not no longer under the law, so to speak. We don't follow the law to satisfy God, but we follow the Spirit and that Spirit by doing, following the Spirit of God and the Word of God, we then satisfy uh, and be, become righteous in His name. You know, the Galatians, the Galatians, they heard about the grace of God. They heard about the grace and the truth that Jesus Christ gave. And they went back. They went back and they started saying that, well, we've got to follow the law. That's the way you do it. And we don't, none of us is justified by the law. We're all guilty by the law. And the Bible says to us in Galatians, uh, the Apostle Paul saying to them, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want you to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh? So we have here the, the Galatians going back to the old law. And we and here the Apostle Paul is saying that we are under the Spirit of God. We are justified by the Spirit, justified by his blood that makes us righteous before God. No man is righteous under the law. All have sinned, the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is what happens uh, when we see the law. But the law serves its purpose. It serves its purpose. It tells us who we are and where we are before God. Now we come to the Ten Commandments compared to the, the blessedness we hear. The Ten Commandments, when you read about it, they say, stop, do not. Do not do this. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not uh, uh, say false witnesses. Do not worship uh, any other God. Do not bow down to them. Do not, do not, do not. That's the, the uh, Ten Commandments as you read them. But when we read about the blessed, blessed are you, as we read in this part of the scripture, it says, blessed are you who are poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. 
So it's a different attitude. It's, it's more, come, come to me, follow Christ, and you'll receive a blessing. And that should be our life, our life being based on that, that we do things not necessarily because uh, we're going to get punished, but we know that as we uh, follow God and follow his uh, blessedness as he speaks here, we get his blessing. It's, it's a blessed thing to do what he wants us to do. And we see this throughout this part of the Bible. Intertwined with uh, the last next couple of chapters are things like uh, explanations about the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. But in this part of the blessedness, we see something different. It's, Christ is calling us. He's saying, come. Whereas the other one in the Ten Commandments says, stop, do not do. And he says, it calls us to him. Blessed are you. Blessed are you if you do these things. Blessed are you. Completely uh, a different way of looking at things, a different attack, so to speak. You know, Jesus didn't, as we read in this part of the, the Bible, it says, I've not come to undo the law. I've come to satisfy the law, to build upon the law. And that's what Jesus is going to do here over the next five chapters and over the whole scripture, that he, he takes the law and not only that, he pays the price for it, all those do-nots and all the things that we've sinned before God, he pays for them. You know, and the, we, we look through uh, various missionary efforts and there are people who, and rightly so, who go out there and talk about the Ten Commandments and how we've broken them because if you don't know that you've broken them, you don't know you're a sinner. And then this part comes along, the fact that we are blessed when we follow him. We are blessed. And people often forget that, especially people who are not, who are not ever church, churchgoers or Bible readers. They will be looking at the law of God and always be terrified. You know, when we were young and we'd go into, into church, Orthodox church, and up on the top there, there'd be a, in the dome, there'd be a big eye and the big eye. And, you know, you'd be scared because they're look, God's looking at you. You know, we always thought, you know, when you go into church, that's when God's got his eye upon you and you've got to act really decent and you can't swear in church and you've got to dress appropriately because in church, that's where he can see you. By reading the scripture, we know that, you know, God sees us everywhere. He sees us at all places. But we don't need to be afraid if we're in Christ. If we're in Jesus Christ, God, it's wonderful having God's eye upon us. He takes care of us. He sees us and he, he cries when we're crying and suffers the same pain that we're suffering when we go through a difficult time. And God looks upon us and he, he wants us to be close to him. And it's good to have his eye upon us. As the Bible says, his eyes upon a sparrow, his eyes upon us. And so when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not a case of I, I'm going to do these commandments because you know I'm going to get punished. It's a case that I want to do things that are pleasing to God because he blesses me, because it's good to do those things. It's good to be uh, in his good book, so to speak, to be on his side and to do things out of love and compassion. I'm not going to go here because, you know what, the Lord doesn't want me to go here. There was a, a statement made many years ago. A particular gentleman went to a particular establishment and he said, you know, he thought to himself, would Jesus come to this establishment? And he thought about it and said, no, nah, he wouldn't come here. I'm not going to go either. I'm not going to go either. There was no law to sort of say, you know, well, you're not supposed to go into that establishment. But he said in his heart, I don't think Jesus will come here. Jesus wouldn't like me to go into this particular place. Therefore, I'm not going to go. So we, that's out of love and compassion for our Lord and Saviour. We are each one of us who know Jesus Christ, we're in a relationship with him. A relationship that comes from his word, that comes through prayer to him, and he speaks to us. How does he speak to us? He reminds us of his word. That's how he speaks to us. As we study his word and we hear his word more and more, there are times in our life, uh, times where he reminds us, the spirit of God uh, says that, that he reminds us of his truth. And in times of doubt, we hear the voice of God. Do not worry, I am with you. You know, do not worry, I am with you. I'm guiding you, I'm holding your hand. 
and he tells us that. And other times, he might say, you, you hear that, don't do that, don't do that. You hear the, the gentle voice of God speaking to each one of us, directing our paths. You come to a crossroad, as you read in the Old Testament, and the, the Spirit of God will tell you to go left or right. He will direct your path, and that's what he does. That's the Spirit of God. And here we see in the blessedness that we're going to read about that when we do things, when we follow him, comes a blessing. And we have ten commandments, and here we have nine blessings. Very much in line with, you know, nine fruits of the Spirit. And here we have nine blessings. Nine blessings. And we read about the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Imagine hearing that up there on the mountain with the Lord and all of those people distraught, all those people who, who have had the illnesses attended to and they look into their hearts and they say, you know what, we, we need God. That's what we hear. We're here to hear more about him. We want to know more about the, what he's done and what he's going to teach us and what he's going to say. And we've got to get to that state where we've got to be poor in the spirit. We've got to recognise our position before God, our position before other men too, in a sense that we are helpless, that we're not that confident, that we haven't got it all together, that we need more than what we can manufacture ourselves. Positive thinking and all those things, they just don't cut it. Once we get to that position that we recognise that we are helpless, and in fact, when we look at this part of this, this particular verse, it goes deeper than that. Once we recognise how sinful we are before God, that we're sinners before God, then, then God can work with us. This is the start and it's interesting how it's the first blessedness that we've got to start with God. Once we recognise who we are before God, our position before God, that we need him. In us is nothing good. We are helpless. We see ourselves. We are sinners and we recognise that. We cannot save ourselves and we then turn to him. Once we get to that point, that lowest point, then we're halfway there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There was a jailer in Philippi. Paul and Silas started their missionary tour, and they went to Philippi. And Philippi is up uh, near Kavala, about 20 minutes from Kavala today. And it's quite a, a unique place, a lot of history. Uh, when you go to Philippi, I, I've been there, had the chance to go there. Uh, you see the Roman amphitheatre. You see, in fact, even the jail that, that Paul and Silas were put into. And Philippi is famous also because the, Alexander the Great's father built his palace upon a lake that was right there. And that's why they called it Philippi after Philip the Great. And the lake there is no longer there. And the history tell you that in the 1920s, when Greece came together and they, they were getting their act together and they were calling uh, from a lot of international help, they got uh, some American engineers to come in and the American engineers drained the lake. They drained the lake and that lake had been there for thousands of years and that's where the palace of Phil Philip was on that lake. And behind that, you had the, the city of Philippi. And the lake's gone, but you see the, all the uh, archaeological uh, pieces there. And we went to uh, the particular jail. You can see it outlined there, and they've got the fencing and so forth. And they say, this is where Paul and Silas were. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it sure looked like a jail to me. And then we went there, and we read about this part of the Bible, where Paul and Silas are in prison. They're prison and, you know, they're locked up. And, you know, being in prison normally, you'd, you know, start crying, you'll start complaining, you'll start doing all those things, you don't want to be there. They were 
praying and singing praises to God. That's what they were doing. And the Philippian jailer heard them. And then all of a sudden there was an earthquake. Earthquake and uh, the doors opened up and their stocks came off their hands and the Philippian jailer was terrified because he was responsible for them. Now, if they, he was responsible if they got out and they were set free, his head was on the, on the take. He, he was going to die. So the Philippian jailer, what he decided to do, he decided to get a sword and he was just about to kill himself and Paul says, stop, don't do that. We are here. We haven't left. And the Philippian jailer comes up to him and says to him, What's, what must I do to be saved? And Paul responds to him and says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he did that. And he did that and he went home and he told his family what had happened and they believed the Lord too. He got to the lowest of low. Helpless. He was responsible. There was only one way out was to kill himself. And at that point in time, he, he called upon the Lord. The, the people of Paul and Silas spoke to him and he found out about the Lord. And I love the phrase that it says that, you know, he asked for a light, a physical light. But he actually got the spiritual light that he could see and he could comprehend now what Jesus had done because he heard them. He heard their uh, praying and he heard their singing and you know why? He, he, he got the gist of what they were there for. He knew exactly what they were there for. They were in prison for their faith. But he heard it and his life turned around. And what happened to him then was that all his house was joyful. Exceedingly joyful, the Bible says. And that's what the blessing does when we come to Christ. From that lowest ebb, that emptiness... Once we recognize who we are before Christ, Christ fills us with his spirit. We have, when we come to Jesus Christ, we believe in him. At that point in time, we're born again. Born again, he fills us with his spirit, and we have the fruits of the spirit in our hearts. The joy, the love, the peace, the long-suffering, the kindness, the gentleness. All those spirits come together, and it's a blessed time. It's blessedness. And this is what we say here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Once we get to that point, then we're there. We're halfway there because God can work in our hearts. You know, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. He was a learned individual. He heard Jesus uh, and then he decided, well, I'm going to go see Jesus. I'm going to have a chat to him. I'm going to go at night so nobody else can see me, but I want to hear from him. What has he got to say? And you can sense a little bit of, you know, I need to hear. I need to hear what this man Jesus has got to say. As soon as Nicodemus came to his house, Jesus says to him, looks him, you can just imagine, looks him straight in the eye and says, you must be born again. First cab off the rank, you must be born again. And he hears those words, and he is in wonder. I mean, born again, do I go back to my mother's womb and I'm born again? And Jesus says, no, no, no. What's of the flesh is of the flesh, but what's of the spirit is of the spirit. You cannot see the wind, but you know where it comes from. Where, you don't know where it comes from, but you know the results of that. It comes and it goes, and so is the spirit of God. And those of us who have been born again comprehend that, the spirit of God coming in. And Nicodemus you know, we don't hear much about him until near the end because he's at the cross, the, the cross of Christ and he's there and he's there to help out and he takes the body and he becomes uh, a believer that's known from there. So it took him a while. It took him a while. But he came to Jesus and he wanted to speak to him. Oh, I need more. You know, my pharmaceutical life, my life that is based on the law or knowing the law, it's not enough. He was... A poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. And now the kingdom of heaven was his. As revealed near the end, as we see him with Jesus' body and he's standing up for Jesus Christ, he was into the kingdom too because he trusted in him. You know, the Christian life is full of 
ebbs and flows. We look at our life, and when we come to Christ, we have this wonderful, wonderful spirit within us. It, you know, it's so different from the, the carnal life and the, the fleshy life we live. We've been changed, renewed. But then the journey starts, the walk starts in Christ. And we start walking, and then, you know what, after a while, we start feeling, again, low in the spirit. We start feeling, you know, we've run out of steam. And in a lot of ways, yeah, we have. It's like that petrol tank. It needs to be, in a way, refilled with God because through the day, through the week, you know, we've, we go in, into this world and we live this world and we, we have to make a living to pay the bills. We have to live a life to, to basically survive in this world. Nobody can lock themselves up in a, in a particular mountain like some people do and rely on some other things. But no, we've got to work, we've got to study, we've got to do all those things. And in the midst of that, we, we stop looking to God and feeding off his word. And we get into a state where we recognise, you know what? I need more. I need to go, I need to, go to church. I need to read. I, I need to uh, be in communion with God. I need to pray. And then when we do those things, bang, there we go again. We fill ourselves with the spirit of God. You know, the Bible says to us, you know, be ye filled with the spirit of God. In a sense that our journey could mean that we, f- we forget God for a while and we, we lose our way in a sense that during the week and so forth. And if you're away from church and you're away from uh, reading the word of God for a while, you know that. You know, those, per- those of us who have been overseas and recognize that over a period of time, wow, you know, wow, I've lost, I lost a little bit of God in my heart because I've focused on these other things. And you feel a bit, you know, as the Bible says here, Pour in the spirit. But then you come back and you say, oh, I rejoice. You rejoice in Jesus Christ because you know that he's there. He's there waiting for each one of us. And as we come back to him, he speaks to us. And we are blessed. We're happy. We start singing with our hearts again. And we start doing those things. So in the Christian life, there are ebbs and flows that each one of us goes through. Downers and, and so forth that take us away But once we recognise that, you know what, I need him. I need him in my life. And then we come back to him. And we receive the internal blessings from him. Oh, I've been away for a bit too long, haven't we? Oh, it's good to be back in church singing praises. And those who have been overseas for a while, when they come back from, from overseas and they come here and they say, oh, it's so good to be back. So good to hear the hymns again. You know, see here, here the, the sermons again, even though sometimes I get bored and so forth, it's good to hear. It's good to be where other believers are. Good to be all together. Good to be because where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst, the Lord says. And he's there and he's here amongst us. And we're blessed. You know, Jesus Christ says this. You know, I, that he hasn't come to make our life miserable. He's come to give us life and to give us life abundantly, abundant life in the spiritual realm, abundant love, abundant joy, abundant peace. He's there waiting for us, and a peace that the world does not know. You know, the whole world is looking for these things, for peace, for joy. You know, sometimes for uh, they use different terminology and different feelings. It's all from outside, you know. How can I... Uh, with my eyes, be satisfied with the world? How can I make me happy, the world? How can I go out there and enjoy myself? That's what life's about, enjoying myself. But once we recognise the power of the Spirit of God within us, that despite the circumstances around us, we've got a glow in our heart, a glow in our heart that comes from the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God glowing in our hearts, and it produces a warmth. Because Christ is in us. And while the world is chasing many, many things, we have a peace that the world does not comprehend, nor understands. We have a wonderful peace. We have a joy. You know, sometimes I I used the word happy a couple of weeks ago to describe this part of the Bible. And when you look at that word happy, you think about, you know, the external happiness but I was really referring to the eternal, internal happiness that comes in knowing Christ, 
wherever we are, whatever our position, Christ within us glowing, glowing within us and producing us, each one of us, the fruits of the Spirit, even long-suffering. That's the fruit of the Spirit, being able to suffer for a long time, endurance, kindness, gentleness, all those things that make up the Spirit of God. And here we are, when we have those, we are blessed. Each one of us can be blessed. Once we recognize our position before God, that is, we can't uh, have these particular fruits of the Spirit of self. They are God-given. We are poor in the Spirit on our own. Separated from God, we are like one of those coals on the fire. Those coals on the fire, I remember Moas would talk about this and say that, you know, we're a Christian glowing together in a church. Once you take one of the coals and you put it aside, it loses its heat. And that's what happens to us sometimes on our own, that we recognise that we are poor in the spirit on our own, but through Jesus Christ, he gives us the heat. He gives us the light. He gives us the truth. And the Bible says to us that you shall know the truth and it shall make us free. It will free us and all the blessings that come from that. You know, when we turn to God and we uh, rely on him more, the blessings come. It's not an internal blessings. You know, some people think of the blessings being, you know, uh, uh, in dollar terms. You know, well, if I'm going to get a blessing, how can I measure it in terms of dollars or something along those lines? God does not work that way. God works in here, in the heart. He speaks to us and he fills our heart. And we are blessed when we follow him. If this evening we are poor in the spirit, then we understand God can work on us, each one of us. If there are people who have never turned to Christ and understand that they need something more than what they have themselves, that's a great starting point. That's how it all starts. This is where it starts. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what it's about. That's how it starts. That when we come to Christ, then he's going to bless us with his wonderful spirit. And we go into the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. It sounds very fanciful sometimes, you know, what the very Jehovah Witness type sort of uh, scenario. But we go into his kingdom because we become part of the believing church. Whether you come to this church or whether you go to another church where you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of the kingdom of God. And God speaks to each one of us. It's a kingdom because he's the king. That he, we follow him. We follow Jesus Christ and that's who we follow. And by following him, we receive his blessings, his wonderful blessings. Whatever state we're in, position we're in, whatever circumstances of life we're in, we can comprehend and feel his blessing. God wants to bless each one of us. And here he gives direction how to do it. Take a step. Understand where we are. Understand what our position is. And if we're poor in the spirit, there we are. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's there for the taking. It's there it's free, as we sung in the first hymn this evening. His grace is free, but we've got to ask for it. We've got to ask for it. You know, the fact that Jesus Christ is amongst us today in this evening is because we asked him to be here. It doesn't come automatically. We asked him. We prayed, Lord, be with us. And he is. And the more hearts that prayed in like terms... The more his presence is felt, we ask him to be here. He's not going to force his way in. And in the same way in our, in our life, we ask him to come into our hearts. He stands in the door and knocks. And if we open our hearts and we let him in, then he gives us our blessing. May God literally and powerfully bless each one of us this evening with his wonderful word. Amen. If we can all stand, we'll sing a song, and we'll say,